live from KSAT 12. The 6 o'clock news starts right now. Not that much longer now. The countdown is on to the total solar eclipse. Yeah, we'll get your eclipse clock. We're now just a little more than 12 out 12 days away from the event that will soon take over the South Texas region. Kerrville said to experience one of the longest spans of time in totality. That's why people around the world will be flocking there. And some businesses in Kerrville have been preparing for that for over a year now. And now less than two weeks away, Courtney Friedman shows us they're ready to put those plans into action. You can feel the energy. Businesses preparing for thousands and thousands of people to descend on Kerrville to catch one of the best eclipse views in the country. I think the hotels are booked. I think people are ready. Brenda Bindock with Shriner Goods says they'll be fully staffed and open for all the business they can get. You'll be ready to go? We're ready, yes. We've got beautiful things to show people, so we hope they come in. <laughs> Here at Divine Sports Bar, head chef Travion Jefferson is prepping for inventory. You know we have, we're going to have to order extra food and there's going to be a lot of people here. Jefferson even it's having to right build now. more storage. You're going to have to find more space. Yeah. This won't be enough. No, not at all. And the whole town is going all out. I even found this t-shirt at the bar saying total solar eclipse and it has the date on it. And you will see the exact same words on signs like this all over town. I think it's safe to say people are excited. Bindock will now? definitely be taking her lunch break that day. We have our glasses. <laughs> glasses ready. We yeah, are ready. Gonna step yes. out during the eclipse. The big concern locals have for visitors is the parking. Lots like this one at the Tyvee Sports Complex have already pre-sold all of the spaces. This garage near the park is free. First come, first serve, but it'll fill up quickly. Still, Jefferson knows people will find a way to get there. They'll figure it out. And these businesses will be taking advantage. A boost in tourism this big, almost as rare as the eclipse itself. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. A lot of businesses cannot wait for all this. By the way, if you're planning on traveling to Kerrville to see the eclipse, you're going to want to plan ahead, especially when it comes to parking. Like Courtney mentioned, these three locations on your screen, free places to park in Kerrville. Again, they're first come, first serve. They're also paid parking options that you can find. You can actually find those at visitkervilletx.gov. Also want to remind you tomorrow our KSAT weather team is helping you get ready for the solar eclipse with some glasses. Meteorologist Sarah Spivey and Mia Montgomery will host an eclipse glasses giveaway at Yanaguana Garden at Hemisphere. The line starts at 4 p.m. tomorrow. The glasses will be handed out at 630. You can find more information on this giveaway on KSAT.com. All right, Adam, I have a question for you. Hmm. There are a lot of places that are going to experience the eclipse. Why is South Texas in the Hill Country especially? popular and that is a good question. It's all climatology. People are flocking here, not just for the slightly longer duration of totality, but you look at climatology for cloud cover and we have the best odds of clear skies that time of year, April 8th. You look at the eclipse day average cloud cover. You get up into the Great Lakes, New England, usually they are very cloudy, whereas around here we have better odds of a clear to even partly cloudy sky. Even if it's partly cloudy, we should be OK. Now, it's still too early to forecast what the sky is going to be like on April 8th. Yes, that information exists out there, but it's garbage. It's trash. I looked at the past 10 years of, of April 8th and we averaged 40 percent of the sky covered by clouds, which still even if that were the case, we'd still have decent viewing. Great articles on KSAT.com, including what if we do have cloud, cov cloud cover. You can go to KSAT.com for that. And we've got rain headed our way for tomorrow morning. We'll get to that in a moment. Coming right up. All right, thank you, Adam. We'll check out traffic right now. I want to show you a slowdown. This is I-10 at Brazos. I think we're looking eastbound here. You can see some construction kind of squeezing those lanes together where it goes from four to three lanes. Again, this is I-10 at Brazos as we're looking towards downtown. The FBI raided multiple spots in neighborhoods in San Antonio today, but they won't say why. Some neighbors, though, were very aware it was going on this morning when they woke up to loud bangs. The FBI confirmed it carried out several raids across the city, including in this neighborhood near Loop 1604 and Bandera Road. But again, they have not confirmed why. Neighbors told us they woke up to those loud bangs as agents forced their way inside a home on Hunter's Raven Street just before 6 this morning. 
saw that they were throwing some kind of concussive charge with some gas into the house and going in and we could see them taking the pictures up in the, the upper stories. Neighbors say they saw agents leading as many as two men out of the home in handcuffs. The FBI says they conducted a second raid on the east side near Hackberry and Iowa streets. Chances are you've probably seen it after spending decades on the side of Loop 410, a San Antonio landmark has a new home at a high school nearly 50 miles to the south. Eight months after the statue of an American Indian was removed from the Red McCombs Superior Hyundai dealership, it has popped up in Jordanton. That's where Garrett Berger says the familiar and to some controversial statue is no longer a marketing gimmick, but a mascot. For years, this statue of an American Indian man waved at drivers from his pole top perch at Red McCombs Superior Hyundai until this past July, when it was removed amid ongoing construction at the dealership. At the time, it wasn't clear where the statue would go. Now we know. Though the statue is still wrapped up, its size and pose are familiar. It's here at the Jordanton High School football stadium, home of the Indians. A crew from a local machine shop put the statue up Monday morning. I went down, I gave him a high five before I came down. <laughs> so it might be the only person to give him a high five. Greg Parrish says his son's on the football team and will play under the gaze of the new statue. It's quite a big figure, and I think it's going to help the, help the guys, help the fans, you know, kind of give them something to look to. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I think it'll be good, you know, a little motivation. We don't know exactly how the statue ended up here, where the school appeared to be trying to keep it under wraps for the moment. Neither the district nor McCombs Enterprises agreed to an interview. After we called multiple times, the district posted an announcement online instead about having acquired the, quote, big chief. They said in part, quote, we acknowledge the significance of the Big Chief and its cultural importance, and we are committed to ensuring that it remains an integral part of our community for generations to come. The announcement was largely cheered on the district's Facebook page, but not everyone's a fan. The head of the American Indians in Texas at the Spanish Colonial Missions had qualms about the statue when it was in San Antonio, largely because it didn't depict the indigenous people who actually lived around here. Now that it's at a school, not a business, he's more frustrated. But it goes to show you that it's the mindset that, you know, all Indians are the same. And so we can get away with it. In Jordanton, I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Work is underway in Uvalde at the site of what will be a new elementary school. That project stems from the tragedy at Robb Elementary in May of 2022. Yeah, ground was broken last year, and as Lee Waldman reports, construction faced a setback, and the foundation behind the build still searching for millions of dollars to fund it. We should have the cafeteria and the uh, uh, other areas done by next week. And so once the pad is complete, then we'll start uh, looking at pouring concrete. It's a night and day difference between the site of the new Uvalde Elementary School today and how things looked five months ago at the groundbreaking. Heavy machinery packing the earth laying the groundwork for the first school built in this district in decades. For example, Batesville uh, is 94 years old um, and has not been touched uh, in terms of renovations, significant renovations for many, many years. Evaldi CISD Moving Forward Foundation is creating this new campus, working with the architecture firm Huckabee to design a school that'll meet the needs of the community with the latest in safety. All of that coming with a big budget of $60 million, Today, John Now and Silver Eagle Beverages donated $1 million. It's overwhelming to be a part of this project in, a, in an amazing way. There's still $20 million to be raised. The foundation, after reopening the bidding process last December, is moving forward with a new construction company, Satterfield and Ponticus. A public school is the center of a community. Uh, there's no doubt about that. And to see the community support come out for this which is a special project, uh, it is, it's, it's really gratifying. The school, which hasn't yet been named, bearing reminders of the 21 lives lost at Robb Elementary, May 24th, 2022. From an oak tree in the library with 21 branches to their names written for all to see, the legacy of the 21 will be lasting. This will be turned into a road that parents will use to drop off their students every day at what will be the front of the new Uvalde Elementary, but there's still a lot to do before it's ready for students. Our target date for substantial completion is September of 2025. 
Um, and then after we get the sign off to get into the building, we'll need to put the desks and the other furniture fixer equipment. From there, the district will make the decisions on when the school is ready for students and teachers. In Uvalde, Lee Waldman, KSAP 12 News. Now, as for the demolition of Robb Elementary, that's at the discretion of Uvalde ISD. Officials there waiting on clearance from the district attorney to move forward before they tear the building down. Six people are now presumed dead after a cargo ship lost power, causing it to crash into the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Maryland this morning. Have you seen this video? Take a look here. Moments after that ship hit the bridge, the bridge tumbled right into the water. The collapse happened just after 1.30 this morning. The six people who are unaccounted for were part of a construction crew filling potholes on the bridge at the time. People in the area say they could hear that bridge falling apart. It was like 1.30 in the morning, we were sitting there and then we just heard a loud bang. We got up and we were like, what the hell was that? It's going to be a tough time. It is. It's going to affect all of us. We just don't realize it yet. Before that crash, ship pilots warned the Maryland Department of Transportation that they were losing power and could crash. That Mayday call potentially saved lives, but the construction crew didn't have time to get away from the danger. The FBI says there is no credible evidence that this incident was terror related. Happening on Thursday, Doc Talk, we take your medical questions to local doctors to get answers. Just scan this QR code to send in your questions for our doctors. Doc Talk airs every Thursday on the news at 630. We cried a lot that first year. Uh, we we cried a lot. Coming up in just a few minutes, millions of caregivers in Texas struggle every day caring for a loved one. Hear from the caregivers themselves about what help they need tonight at 6.30. Plus. He is grateful to have what he has, his life. A teen sharing his story in hopes of convincing others to become an organ donor. Hear from him and his mother and the information you need to save someone's life. Coming up next. But first, let's take a quick look outside with live cam. Some rain in the forecast for tomorrow morning's commute. Meteorologist Adam Kasky breaks it all down after the break. A local family hopes their story will encourage others to give the gift of life. Without one family's sacrifice, 16-year-old Zach Baza wouldn't be alive today. Daniela Ibarra spoke with Zach's mother, who says she thinks about her son's organ donor every single day. Zach Baza is a pretty laid-back 16-year-old. I like to hang out with friends. Okay. And read books. Oh, my gosh. His mom, Carmelita, can't believe he's made it this far. I'm so proud of him. I mean, I'm, I'm proud of where we are. Soon after Zach was born, doctors realized his liver was failing. At six months old, he needed a triple organ transplant, a new liver, small bowel, and pancreas. Doctors weren't sure if he'd live long enough to get them and prepared Carmelita for the worst. I didn't even know what to do. I was like, how do you... How do you make funeral arrangements for a baby? I mean, I just, it, it just, I couldn't wrap my head around it. In April of 2008, the family of a four-year-old who lost their life realized their child could live on in another. It, it would take me a while to find the words uh, other than thank you, and that's just so, just so incomplete, so inadequate, you know. A scar on Zach's stomach serves as a reminder of what he's overcome. I used to say that um, I think uh, I got cut with like a samurai sword <laughs> by an actual samurai. He doesn't remember what the start of his life was like, but Zach knows how he plans to live the rest of it. It's a blessing, basically. And it's it sounds unreal, but um, it's just um, that I'm grateful to have what I have. Daniela Ibarra, KSAT 12 News. Listen, I remember oh being gosh. 16 years of age. Mm -hmm. Being cut by a samurai, samurai sword <laughs> sounds cool, but being the recipient of yeah. organs that saved my life, 
that's, that's even cooler. That's amazing. Yeah, Gosh, it's so heartwarming. All right, happening tomorrow, we're hosting a town hall to share the facts about organ donation. We'll talk about the importance of organ donation as well as the challenges and misconceptions around it. Think about it. You're impacting a person. You're impacting a family. Someone gave Carmelita mm -hmm. her son. The town hall starts at 2 p.m. Wednesday. You can watch it on KSAT.com or any way you stream. All right, let's turn to the forecast out there. So we got a little more rain back in the forecast, Adam. Yeah, it's sliding back into the forecast, especially tomorrow morning, late tonight and tomorrow morning. Let's take a look at our rain chances just for the day tomorrow, starting at 4 a.m., only 10 percent. But a couple hours later, we're up to 40%. So scattered coverage, overall dampness in our area. And by the noon hour, those rain chances fall back off again and we'll have some sunshine. Notice at 4 p.m. that 20% chance, there's a little blip, a little rise. That's because we could have one or two thunderstorms pop up tomorrow afternoon. But really the focus is in the morning when we'll see the dampness. In the afternoon, it's a, it's a long shot, just that slight chance. A lot of activity in terms of rain along the East Coast, mid-Atlantic, some snow on the cold side of this system. But what we're watching is this development of shower activity in New Mexico and West Texas embedded within this upper level trough, this dip in the flow and this northwesterly flow. We have some energy and this push of energy is looking like it's going to develop some areas of rain later tonight after midnight, closer to the Rio Grande and into the hill country. Pre dawn hours slowly pushing towards San Antonio and for the morning commute, we are likely to have some scattered areas of light rain. That's the key. This is looking pretty light in nature and don't get very excited in terms of overall accumulations and rainfall potential through nine o'clock areas of rain. Then by noon midday, we'll start to clear out and we'll have a lot of sunshine. So the first part of the day, a little damp second half of the day, will have sunshine and temperatures will be a little cooler than average for this time of year. But you look at the rainfall potential and for the most part, we're looking at a few hundredths of an inch in a few of the luckiest areas. You could get just over a tenth of an inch. That possibility exists. All right, let's talk temps this morning. 51 this afternoon, 73, both below average for this time of year. And look at the record high 97. That just gives you an idea of the potential this time of year and we're far from that. There's actually a cold front to the north of us. So Dallas, Abilene, Lubbock on the cool side of it at 59 for their temperature right now. Meanwhile, you get to Laredo at 82, Brownsville at 75. Here's San Antonio officially 71, Hondo 76 and currently 68 Bulverde and Canyon Lake. Tomorrow morning, a bit of a chill in the air. We'll be in the upper 40s around San Antonio and even some mid 40s in parts of the hill country. We'll say 48 in town, but you go to the south side, 50 degrees to start the day. By noon, we're up to 62 with the sun starting to break out. And then five o'clock, our high temperature of 72. That's 72 in most of San Antonio. By the Rio Grande, a little closer to 80 degrees. Castroville, 74, 74 downtown tomorrow in Lavernia, 72. Notice the high temperature trend. We're back into the 80s, hitting 80 Friday into the 80s by this upcoming weekend. And another noticeable change coming our way. Dew points will be rising. Right now we have the dry air in place. Dewey's in the 20s to near 40 degrees. But that's going to be changing as the wind comes off the Gulf of Mexico. We'll gradually see those dew points rise. And by Saturday, you'll feel the mugginess back in the air. It's going to be sticky this weekend and into early next week. And I do think that means some areas of morning fog and mist on Easter Sunday, not rainy, just that little bit of, you know, foggy, misty dampness. Now coming up at 645, talking more about the path of totality. Who's in it? Who's not? Enough to ruin your Easter hair. Come on. <laughs> or make it better. <laughs> I guess. All right. Thanks, Adam. <laughs> Adam mm -hmm. thinks it would make it better. Yeah, just so you know. Of course he would. Yeah. All right. <laughs> we called him Sohan the man at five o'clock. Yeah. He came through. He certainly did come through. And the thing is, he said it all started with them setting the tone, the yeah. Spurs, compared to the previous game when the Suns set the tone, beating the Spurs. And you know what? Sohan had a monster game, all while guarding Kevin Durant. And Jeff Trailer talks depth chart and what does it take to play for him coming up.
I think it's safe to say this girl who flew 6,340 miles from Poland to see Jeremy Sohan play left the Frostbank Center all smiles last night. Sohan's stat line versus the Suns was pretty sweet. 26 points, a career high, 18 rebounds, one block, one steal, one assist, 10 for 19 from the floor, five for five from the free throw line, zero turnovers, and the game-winning three-pointer with less than 30 seconds left in regulation. Spurs end their eight-game homestand with a 104-102 win. Sohan was a rebounding machine all while guarding Kevin Durant. Definitely. I think, you know, the, the main thing was, you know, just being physical. I feel like last game we didn't start off physical. You know, they brought the game to us. And I feel like today we changed that a little bit. And, you know, we, we started off playing, you know, fast because of getting rebounds and just playing. And, uh, you know, that's that's really important. Just starting the game physical and, you know, letting, letting it come to them too. Katie is such a difficult matchup for everybody you know he's one of the greatest ever and uh, Jeremy never stopped working his butt off I mean, he's very physical and uh, did everything he could to guard a great player so he deserves a lot of credit and he also hit the board for us and he had about I don't I didn't see that I think 16 17 boards I think uh, tonight was it yeah so he was he was very special KD and the Suns are fighting to make the playoffs. They're currently eighth in the Western Conference, which would land them in the play-in tournament if the season ended today. And they're just one half game out of sixth place, which would mean they could avoid the play-in altogether. Add in no Wimby, and it's no wonder Suns head coach Frank Vogel wasn't happy with the outcome last night. It's unacceptable to lose that game, you know, for our guys. You know, we all said the right things. We all uh, did the right preparation to come in, but we didn't play with the necessary focus and disposition uh, throughout, uh, the, I would say, the first half. And you give a team like that life, and that's how the NBA works. They get they get going, they get charged up, they start believing they can, they, can, they have a chance to win it. And um, credit those guys, They, you know, with Victor out, those guys played really well. The Spurs will next play at the Utah Jazz tomorrow night at 8. Pop said Wimby has a little better than a 50-50 chance to play in that game. It was a nice morning for football at the race practice fields on the main campus at UTSA where the Roadrunners kicked off their third week of spring practice. Coach Traylor said they started off a little lethargically in the meetings, but it turned out to be an energetic, juiceful day. The Roadrunners scrimmage this past Saturday, just another step in the process when it comes to setting the depth chart. Now we always adjust depth charts. Uh, that's a daily deal here. Uh, but. Like I've told y'all a million times and my team too, I, I really do believe in playing a bunch of kids. So whether you're a one, two, or a three for us, it really doesn't matter. You're gonna get in the rotation if you know what you're doing and you make plays. If you don't know what you're doing and you don't make plays, you're not gonna get to play. Um, so I don't, we're not guaranteed to go three deep, but we will rotate almost every position on the field except for probably the quarterback position. And we are getting closer to the Roadrunners Fiesta Spring Game, an official Fiesta event set for 2 p.m. Saturday, April 13th at the Alamo Dome. I just, I love hearing Coach Trey. I do too. Just, you know, <laughs> I can listen, if you make plays, you're going to play. I can listen to his sound bites all day. Yeah. That's Agree. Cool. <laughs> We've got other things we got to do, though. Okay. <laughs> Maybe some other day. Solutionaries is coming up next. It is not an easy fact to accept. According to the Texas Department of Health and Human Services, three and a half million Texans are caregivers for a sick or elderly family member. So what help do they need? What gaps in the system are holding them hostage? Courtney Friedman went straight to caregivers themselves to get those answers. We cried a lot that first year. Uh, we, we cried a lot. I had to uh, retire my job of 34 years. Their loved ones' diseases, ages, and outcomes are different, but the words these caregivers use to describe their experiences are so similar. We've been married 46 years. Jim Calhoun's wife, Pam, was diagnosed with Alzheimer's 12 years ago. While she still interacts with people. Thank you, red is my favorite. <laughs> How did you know, Pam? Like <gasps> red is my favorite. But she cannot have full conversation. Conversations. Well, we're just eating Skittles. <laughs> he felt alone, exhausted, and depressed until he reached out to the Alzheimer's Association, which led him to a support group. This past six, seven months, I mean, it's, it's, been, it's been hell. I don't mind. 
They even gave him advice when he made the gut-wrenching decision to move his wife to a memory care center. It was really awful, but but you know, I said I couldn't go through this. That's because he was advised to do his homework and visited five centers multiple times before choosing the landing at Stone Oak. And he says Pam is doing great there. The big issue he sees is with insurance coverage. We need insurance companies to allow us to pay for this type of care. For other dementia caregivers, even if they did have insurance, they're not really open to the idea of nursing homes. Mama, I love you. <laughs> so there she says, to, I love you back. My night, okay? Minerva Longoria's 92-year-old mother, Minnie, was diagnosed yeah. with dementia four years ago. And when she looked for care facilities, she wasn't happy with what she saw. The uh, short staff and also COVID going around, flu, it's also fear of the caregiving quality in the nursing homes. That's why she's thrilled to see House Bill 1673 just passed in Texas, which requires more training for residential center employees to improve the quality of care. In Texas, there are 1.5 million dementia caregivers that, that provide over $24 billion in unpaid care. Longoria could have been one of them, but found out that she could get paid for caregiving. But that income is just $10.60 an hour with no benefits. They should definitely be paid more Jenny Funk has been a caregiver, but is also the director of programs for the Alzheimer's Association South Texas chapter. We refer to the Area Agency on Aging quite a lot. They get Older Americans Act funding that helps pay for some short-term respite, caregiving in the home. And more progress is happening right now. The 2024-2025 state budget directed $5.5 million over the next two years to the Texas Department of State Health Services Alzheimer's Disease Program which includes services for caregivers. Another expensive and long-term disease is ALS. Being given a terminal diagnosis is shattering uh, through the soul. Juan Reyes got his full ALS diagnosis in 2015. The only thing Juan can move is one finger, meaning he needs 24-7 care. We have our morning routine and then I get him dressed. I there's days we shower him, there's days we sponge bath him and get him dressed. Juan's wife, Meg, has been a constant, unwavering support system. Since Juan is a veteran, Meg has been asked to help set up a general caregiver support group at the VA. But that's just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the couple's involvement in furthering resources for families battling ALS. I think that biggest gap is the cost and, and not enough quality candidates out there. But if you work with a company that, that has caregivers, there's certain limitations. Like if you want someone that's going to transport you, it's going to cost you more. So Juan and Meg use their voices and their voices are not quiet. You have to be your own advocate sometimes. Texas has the second largest population of ALS caregivers at 2.1 million, and the ALS Association Caregiver Needs Survey showed the most needed care programs are home visits and equipment loan programs. There is no national network that anyone can tap uh, to uh, find the equipment. That's why Meg and Juan are part of a grassroots effort in South Texas to coordinate equipment swaps between families. The diseases of ALS and Alzheimer's have in common the age of patients, typically older, while other diseases like cancer can leave patients caregiving for their younger kids. 10-year-old Charlotte Pollock is now a cancer survivor, but that's not what defines her. Volleyball and playing with my friends. But cancer did dominate her life for years, starting at the age of nine months. We found the first tumor on her adrenal gland and they were able to remove that and no treatment was necessary. But that cancer led to a more devastating diagnosis called Lee-Fermini syndrome. She's predisposed to uh, cancer more so than other people would be. And at three years old, they found a brain tumor which required surgery and 18 months of chemo. This zoom interview with Katie at home and Ryan at work as a firefighter, a realistic look into the family's divide and conquer attitude. They say they owe their success to their family, community, and to the American Cancer Society, 
all stepping in to guide them towards resources. I've been a caregiver. I lost my mother in 1998 to breast cancer. That's what led Jeff Bayless to become the executive director of the American Cancer Society South Region, offering services he wants families to know about. That includes a 24-7 care line, and they even just launched a new app called ACS Cares, a patient and caregiver support system right on your phone. Well, you can call us in terms of transportation to get someone to treat me. Lodging if you're being treated out of town. Our, our advocacy team is, you know, at the federal level and in every state house, constantly trying to remove barriers to, you know, to, to get navigation covered by insurance. Navigation basically means caseworkers that help guide families through the complicated process. This is something we'll do for the rest of her life. She'll have head to toe annual MRIs. Uh, every three months. If they have to face it again, they'll know where to turn. I even have a memory of my dad like, sleeping on the bench one night. It's the essential tool for all caregivers to give care while also setting themselves free. I'm very fortunate to be able to look into my mama's eyes and look at her, her with a different love. But in the end, the most important thing they all have in common is that under all the heartache and stress, is unwavering love. It is immeasurable the gratitude that we have for our caregivers. For Solutionaries, I'm Courtney Friedman. It's such a powerful story there, and, and I, you know, the caregivers getting the support and knowing what to do is part of the problem. I have a mother that has Alzheimer's, and I know it, what struck me is the, the wife of the gentleman with ALS saying, right. you have to be your own advocate. And there are so many people who are going through this step by step who have become advocates for others. And like, you know, Jim Calhoun, we featured first in the story, finding that support, somebody else to hold his hand and help him walk through that is something that's also immeasurable. And, and that's what I think, you know, when I look at my mother, she's still in there. She's not the same person she was, but she's still in there somewhere. I can see right. it in her eyes. And so that's what keeps a lot of people going. Yeah, it's yeah. love that keeps people going, right? Yep, absolutely. Now, if you're interested in this story, you want to see some of our other Solutionaries coverage as well, perhaps. Just scan this QR code on your screen. You can also tell us what issues that you want us to address or what creative solutions that you've come up with. We'll be right back. Well, here's a question. Could soda be good for you? You've probably seen some new cans, new bottles at grocery stores and gas stations. Yeah, soda. Caskey says pop. The yes. labels have health claims boosting immunity or easing stress. But is it true? 12 on your side's Marilyn Moore. It sorts through the hype. The industry calls these functional beverages, often containing ingredients once only found in supplements or herbal teas. It was important that it tasted good. Why not? What do I have to lose? If it works, then great. A lot of these cold drinks contain probiotics or prebiotics, like culture pop soda. Consumer Reports says the wild berries and lime has a blended sweet tart taste and no sugar substitutes. Healthier than actual soda, but... Drinks with added probiotics may not have the same health benefits as foods like yogurt or kimchi. Think of them as a shot of supplement in a drink form. They don't have the variety of bacteria or other healthful compounds that fermented foods do. What about green juices? They're an easy way to get some vitamins and minerals, but Keating says they shouldn't replace your veggies. Look for ones with vegetables high on the ingredients list. Suja Organic Cold Press Mighty Dozen with little fruit juice has 80 calories and 12 ounces. But look, the Naked Juice Green Machine with fruit juice listed at the top has 270 calories in 15 ounces. Drinks marketed as stress relievers like Recess Infused Sparkling Water Mood and Droplet Sparkling Self Care can make a tasty alcohol-free alternative to a cocktail. But Keating says it's not clear if their calming effects are really significant. And energy drinks, they've been around a while, but new ones like Aspire, Celsius, and Clean contain natural sources of caffeine. Chemically, though, there's no difference. Cheers. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. Droplet Sparkling Self-Care. <laughs> That's the name of one of those we drinks. All, we can all use a dropper. Yeah. Too. If only it worked. All right, another look outside with live cam. Rain in the forecast for tomorrow. You can see some impressive clouds out there right now. 
Here, I'll just Adam Kasky tells us how much rain we could get after the break. All right, Adam Kasky, we are hoping for some rain. Let's talk timing. Oh, yeah, we have a lot to talk about here. Oh, we've I've been getting some <laughs> eclipse stuff ready. So you're to go. excited about it. Yeah, yeah, I've been getting some eclipse stuff ready to go. So I'm going to start with the eclipse. Then we do have rain moving in. It's going to move in tomorrow morning, late tonight, pre dawn hours, and then be gone by noon tomorrow. So let's get to the total solar eclipse. And I want to start with a little explanation because, you know, some of your Maybe one. Wait, we have lunar eclipses, solar eclipses, total solar eclipse, annular eclipse. This is what we're dealing with. The moon is going to move perfectly between the sun and the earth. So that means the moon is going to block out the sun and cast its shadow along a narrow path of the earth, which happens to be Mexico, Texas and 15 other states of the US. So that's what we're seeing here. It's when that moon goes between the sun and the Earth. And this is going to be more unique compared to the one in, was it 2017, I think it was? Because the moon is going to be closer to the Earth. So, really amplifying the time that we're going to be in totality and the, the, the duration of it and making the totality with the path a little bit wider. Not everybody's going to be in totality. Now, if you are fortunate enough to be in totality, there will be a period of time, maximum a little over four minutes, minimum about a minute, where you can safely take off your eclipse glasses. Go to ksat.com for more information, and we encourage you always to be wearing those glasses unless you know exactly what you're doing. But you look closely, and totality, which, you know, 99% doesn't count. Doesn't count. You got to be in totality for this. You really have to be in totality if you really want to experience the effects of the eclipse. Northern Hills neighborhood, yeah, 99% not good enough. Just go near the airport and you're in totality. SeaWorld, Castroville, Lytle, only the part of Lytle that's north of I-35. So that's the high school, that's the elementary school. They are within totality. We've got all this information and interactive maps on KSAT.com. It's still too early to tell what the cloud cover is going to be for the forecast for April 8th. But you look at the climatology, I crunched the numbers. Our average amount of sky covered by clouds is about 40%. Rain chances tomorrow? 40%, what a coincidence. And that's for the morning hours. That's because we'll have the areas of light rain moving in. Starting closer to the Rio Grande and in the hill country after midnight, then moving towards San Antonio. Off and on, light rain for the morning commute. As for overall accumulations, don't get your hopes up. We're looking at a few hundredths of an inch for most of us. Some of the luckier and luckiest locations could get just over a tenth of an inch. That's about it. Afternoon sunshine tomorrow. By noon, the rain's done. We have sunshine. 48 in the morning, so another cool morning. 72 in the afternoon. Humidity's back for the weekend. I think that's going to give us some morning fog and mist Easter Sunday and 80s by the weekend. All right. Thanks, Adam. We're going to talk about horses and brackets in the bus. In the buzz today, dash cam video captured this not so high speed chase. A horse took its time leading Ocala, Florida police on a tepid trot down a state road. Yeah, officers were able to get the horse to stop soon after the county's agricultural unit was called in. They transported the not so fast and furious filly to greener pastures. He didn't seem too concerned. No, he's fine. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> or she. Yeah, we don't really know. <laughs> All right, after the first two rounds of the NCAA tournament, just four perfect brackets remain, and they're all in the women's tournament. NCAA.com says there were more than 4 million entries across major online games for the women's tournament. After 48 games, Yahoo Sports has one perfect bracket left. ESPN has three. There were 1,300 perfect brackets going into the second round. There are no perfect brackets left in major online games for the men's NCAA tournament. Both tournaments have arrived at the Sweet 16. Do you have a bracket? I didn't even do one. You know, you know the team that killed me in my bracket? Yes. Kentucky. Kentucky. Killed a lot of brackets. She's a Kentucky and fan. My spirit. Yeah. <laughs> we'll Cuts right deeper than just a bracket for you. We'll be right back. 
So we talked about the morning dampness, very light rain, most of us under a tenth of an inch. And then in the afternoon, one or two pop up non severe storms could develop. But really, it's just looking sunny and dry the second half of the day. Cool though, 48 in the morning, 72 for the high locally, a little bit closer to 80 degrees along the Rio Grande. All right, thanks, Adam. And thank you for watching the news at six. See you on the night beat.